Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for being with us today. We will go ahead and get started, and I have uh, Secretary Kathy Bookbar with us. Go ahead, Secretary. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Election Day. I can't help but think today of the suffragists who exactly 100 years and one day ago flocked to the polls to eagerly cast their very first ballot in the November 2nd, 1920 presidential election. They did not take their vote for granted or believe it didn't matter because they had fought so hard and endured so much to obtain it. American women had to wait an extraordinarily long time to vote, 144 years after the birth of our democracy. Many other Americans, voters of color, had to wait even longer. Last year, I was incredibly honored to join 17 of my National Association of Secretary of State colleagues on a journey to Selma, Birmingham, and Montgomery, Alabama, to share, witness, and try to absorb the historical moments and landmarks that epitomize the devastating struggles and inspiring achievements of the voting rights movement. These civil rights struggles and victories helped persuade President Johnson to sign the Voting Rights Act of 1965, finally ensuring voting rights for all Americans. Thanks to the giants of the suffragist and civil rights movements, we in this nation have been granted the opportunity and the responsibility to make a difference in this world and to leave it a better place. Today, let's honor their sacrifices by voting and participating in our great democracy. If you haven't already done so, please vote. If you are a mail ballot voter, return your ballot in person now. If you're planning to vote at the polls, go now. Don't delay. The clock is ticking. You have only hours left to exercise your precious right to vote. Let your voice be heard as the suffragists and the civil rights activists would want you to. And now I have the latest uh, numbers to share with you. So I'm just gonna go right to the mail-in and absentee ballots. So as of um, the final numbers I, for the absentee, mail -in, uh, absentee and mail-in applications statewide, uh, were 3,098,947 uh, and the ballots are in the process of mailing and this may be slightly delayed. So I'm guessing that nearly all of them are, but I have 3,082,832 uh, return ballots. So I'm happy to say that we've broken 2.5 million. So we have 2,506,555 ballots have already been returned uh, as of early this morning. That's over 81% of the ballots out, out there. Of that 2.5 million, 1,641,826 are Democratic voters, 586,336 are Republican voters, and 278,393 are uh, independents and other parties. And again, for those of you who haven't heard me say this before, just for historic context, so we're going to end up somewhere probably in the realm of 2.6 million, which is literally 10 times as many ballots as were cast by mail in 2016. So in 2016, we had 266,208 civilian absentee ballot ca ballots cast. In 2012, it was 248,561. Polls, as we all know, are open and safe. Pennsylvanians been, began voting at the polls at 7 a.m. this morning. Uh, I heard this morning uh, that some people were even lining up shortly after 6 a.m. So the engagement was high from early this morning, which is great. The polls will remain open until 8 p.m. tonight. If a voter is in line at 8 p.m., they can vote. Doesn't matter how long that line is, as long as they're in line by 8 p.m., they should stay there and they'll be able to vote. As you all know, we expect very healthy turnout given the intense interest in this election uh, and especially in Pennsylvania's critical role in it. Voters can find their polling place at votespa.com. They should wear a mask to protect themselves, their families and other voters and practice social distancing at the polls. 
Department of State, in partnership with Pima, has provided counties with masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray, sneeze guards, uh, tape to mark social distance. The polling places will be safe for all Pennsylvanians. There's only uh, some hours left to return your mail ballot. So as we've been saying all along, anyone who has not returned a mail ballot should do so now. You should hand deliver, do not put it in the mail. Hand deliver your mail ballot to your county election office, satellite election office, or other designated drop off location or drop box. I urge everybody not to wait until close to the 8 p.m. deadline. Some drop boxes and satellite offices will not be open till eight. So you should absolutely go onto votespa.com or onto your county election website to check the hours of the drop boxes and satellite locations in your county. Um, but unlike when you're in line at 8 p.m. at the polls where you do have the right to vote, if you're in line at 8 p.m. at a drop box, it's not the same thing. The drop boxes will need to be closed and locked at 8 p.m. So don't cut it close. If you're voting by mail, drop it off early, early, early. Okay, and I think I said this already, but voters can find your county's mail ballot return locations and hours at votespa.com. Voted mail ballots cannot be returned to polling places. I know there's been a little bit of some social media or something, so I just wanna make that clear. Um, you can't bring your mail ballot and cast it at a polling place. Of course, what you can do is you can um, surrender your mail ballot and vote by regular, by regular voting system. But if you're looking to cast your ballot, you can only do it on those designated locations by the counties. As we've been saying, voters need to make sure that they are not returning a naked ballot. Uh, ballots need to be sealed inside the inner white secrecy envelope and then that inner white secrecy envelope in the outer declaration envelope that's pre-addressed to the county uh, and that the voter must sign that declaration on the outside. If a voter learns today through various notifications, whether email or otherwise, that they returned a naked ballot or perhaps forgot to sign their voter declaration, they can still go to the polls today and vote by provisional ballot. So I wanna urge anybody, if you get some notification that your ballot, your mail or absentee ballot was not counted for a reason that's other than due to your eligibility. So if you're an eligible voter, but you left out that you know, secrecy envelope or something like that, you still can vote by provisional ballot. I wanna remind all voters also, whether you're voting by mail or you're voting in person at a hand-marked uh, paper ballot county, that some ballots are two-sided. So remember to vote both sides of your ballot. And uh, just a reminder back to mail voting that under Pennsylvania law, voters have to return their own ballots. The, that, so you can't return a ballot for your spouse or your friend. The only exceptions to this is for voters with a disability who have designated an agent to do this for them, and there's a special form for that that you could find online at votespa.com, or voters who need an emergency absentee ballot, they can also have a designated agent. And those agents, by the way, can pick up the ballot and return them. Okay, um, as, we, as I mentioned briefly, uh, voters who have changed their mind, they got a mail ballot, but they've decided they wanna vote in person instead, that's fine, uh, thanks to Act 12 of 2020. Voters can take, they have to take their mail ballot and the outer envelopes to their polling place and wait in line just like everybody else, go up to the poll worker when you check in and say, I wanna surrender, surrender my mail ballot and vote on the regular voting system. The, the poll worker will take your ballot, they'll void it, you'll sign a special declaration, and then you'll just be able to vote on the regular voting system like any other, any other voter. If you don't have your ballot or outer envelope, with you, um, you can still vote by provisional ballot. So same thing, get in line, tell the poll worker that you applied for a mail and absentee ballot but didn't cast it, and they'll allow you to vote for, by provisional ballot, and that provisional ballot will be counted as long as they don't, as long as you haven't voted by some other means. Okay, uh, and, but voters who have actually cast their mail ballot, um, to their county board of elections are not eligible to vote at their polling place. And no, Pennsylvania does not allow people to change their minds. So once you've voted, uh, you can't change your mind and re-vote. Okay, um, so voter rights. Just, I wanna remind everybody who's going to the polls today, um, only first time voters or those voting for the first time in their precinct must show ID. 
if a voter's name is not in the poll book and the voter is told they're registered in a different precinct, if it's possible, they should go to that correct polling place to, to cast their vote because that way they could be assured that the entire vote will count. If they can't, um, they can't, they don't have time to go somewhere else, they can still vote by provisional ballot and that ballot will be counted for all the races that that voter is eligible for. Voters who moved within Pennsylvania but didn't have a chance to update their address in time before the election can still go back to their old polling place one more time to vote. So when you, so if you've moved, you can still go back to your old place if you haven't registered at the new place. Go to your old polling place, say, I moved, but I wanted to you know, vote here one more time, and they'll ask you to update your address at the polling place. Uh, I also want to remind voters that if 50% or more of the voting systems at your polling place are not working, voters have the right to vote by what's called an emergency paper ballot. It's just another paper ballot, um, and it allows you to not have to wait if the systems are broken. Uh, you can vote that emergency paper ballot, and that will be counted like a regular ballot. If a voter is challenged on the basis of identity or residency, um, the voter may vote normally by signing a challenge affidavit and producing a witness who can, is a registered voter of the precinct to vouch for them. If the voter cannot or does not want to produce a witness, they can still cast a provisional ballot. And I wanna be clear that the only bases for a challenge are identity or residency or qualifications as an eligible voter for your precinct. So it's very limited, the types of things that you can be challenged on. Voters have a right to assistance at the polling place, including foreign language or literacy assistance, as well as assistance for voters with disabilities. Um, also, a voter who experiences intimidation, harassment, or discrimination should report it to the County Board of Elections, the local district attorney's office, and should also call the toll-free number of the Department of State, 877-VOTES-PA. Uh, and you can also call the U.S. Department of Justice's voting section at 800-253-3931. Election returns. So as you've all heard, we've refreshed the Department of State's display of election returns data at electionreturns.pa.gov, including an update of uh, that itemizes votes cast by in-person voting at the precincts, mail-in and absentee voting, and provisional ballots. We also created a supplemental dashboard to show the progress of ballots cast that have not yet been counted. This is broken down by county. A demo of that new dashboard is available on votespa.com, and that will be updated throughout the night. So, and Day. So the, we will collaborate with county election offices to post results as soon as they're available, obviously after the polls close, um, and that will inc also include the itemized results as I talked about. Um, and the dashboard, again, will show you not only what's been counted, but it'll also show you what remains to be counted. So you could track that for the entire canvassing period. Um, the Let's see, provisional ballots won't be started until later. So as soon as, so don't be surprised if on the provisional ballot page you see zeros because they're gonna get through the other ones first. Okay, um, so also just a reminder, I think we all have heard me say this a lot of times, but races are never finished. Uh, election, you know, vote, uh, vote counting is never finished, ever finished on election day. Um, and if we stop counting ballots on election day, we will be disenfranchising all the men and women who serve our country, all the military and civilian overseas voters whose ballots by law must be accepted up until seven days after the election. I know that none of us want to disenfranchise all the military overseas voters, as well as the millions of other Pennsylvania voters who have exercised their fundamental right to vote. So we, we are the only ones who can actually declare a uh, result of an election or an election count being over. Um, so, you know, patience, everybody should have patience. We, while we expect the overwhelming majority of Pennsylvania ballots to be counted within a few days, our first priority and our county's first priority is to accurately and securely count every legal ballot cast.
and then to count them as quickly as humanly possible. You've heard me talk about this before. Many counties are gonna be counting 24 seven to get this done as quickly as humanly possible. And you know their dedication and commitment to this is just outstanding. Okay, we'll be holding press conferences at 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. tonight at the Farm Show Complex. We sent out media advisories on this press conference on these press conferences last night and this morning. Please check the advisory for details and RSVP information. And I hope to see you there later. And I last want to take this moment once again to tremendously thank all our election personnel from all around the state from county election directors to poll workers, from boards of election to those canvassing our mail ballots. Uh, they are all, every one of them, heroes. Without them, we would have no democracy. We would not have the ability to exercise our fundamental right to vote. So please, today, take a moment, thank a poll worker, thank an election worker, make sure that they know how much all of us appreciate all they do to ensure that we can exercise our right and express our voice in this great democracy we have. Thank you, and now I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Secretary. Um, a couple of reminders. We ask that each reporter limit themselves to one question in fairness to all the others who are waiting to ask questions. Also, if you indicated on your RSVP that you'd like to be called on for a question, your screen name needs to indicate who you are, uh, first and last name. If, if you don't have your name on, on uh, up as a screen name, you probably won't be called on. Uh, we're gonna start with Mike Rubenkam from the AP, and then we'll go to Mark McPet from Bloomberg. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Secretary, the Trump campaign and Republicans in general are making a number of allegations about voting in Philadelphia, uh, including that Trump poll watchers are being blocked from polling places, uh, poll, poll watchers are being kept far away from counting tables, uh, and Democrats electioneering inside polling places. Um, have you gotten any of these reports and, and have you investigated any of them and, and found them to be either accurate or inaccurate? Thank you. Sure, I have not gotten any of those reports. But now I will make sure that we follow up with Philadelphia and others to make sure that we have the updated information, but that's the first that I'm hearing of that. I haven't heard it, and I should be clear, like I haven't heard from voters, I haven't heard it from, uh, from anyone. So um, we will check in on that and I'll report back later. Thank you, Secretary. We'll go to Mark Niquette from Bloomberg News. And, um, next up will be uh, Christine Vendel from Penn Live. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Hi, Secretary. With the 20% or so um, uh, applications uh, that have not been returned, is there any way to suss out, you know, how many of those might be, you know, voters who are going to show up at the polls and surrender their ballot to, to cast a regular one or vote provisionally? Uh, versus ballots that might still be arriving by mail or just aren't going to be cast? Sure. I mean, you know, of course we can't get in the head of everybody, but what I will tell you is, and actually I'm glad you brought it up because I think the percentages are, are misleading in some ways when you're not aware of how, what the usual is, right? So we looked actually before the primary, we looked back historically at prior elections and we saw that um, historically, about 70 to 80% of the ballots that were mailed to voters were cast by voters. So that's the normal in regular years. And, that, and I think um, in the primary, it ended up being somewhere maybe just short of 80%. And actually it was, it was around 80% in the primary, even with that weak extension of mail delays you know, for the counties that had been experiencing civil unrest. So even with that extra week, it ended up somewhere right around 80% or just short of that. So we've already exceeded that. We've already exceeded the average and we still have all day today because the, the, the numbers that I gave you were from very early this morning. So I think we've already received higher than the average number of, based on those percentages of what we would expect to be cast by mail, which is great. However, um, I do think there's probably a fair number of voters who 
requested their ballot just in case, you know, to protect that option, but will show up in person. So um, we're very pleased. I think, you know, we'll, we'll obviously have uh, updated numbers after the deadline closes. Um, and then of course there's the late arriving ballots as well, but just as of this morning, we're in a very good, a very good percentage of the voters have already returned them. All right, we have Christine Vendel from Penn Live, and next up will be Bill Kibler from the Altoona Mirror. Go ahead, Christine. Christine Vendel, you should be able to unmute. Sorry, I was talking to myself there for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I was wondering if you could give us a rundown of problems that have been reported. I understand there's that hotline and is there a way to break down for us what you've been hearing? Because we do see some things on social media, like there was somebody said there were problems in Luzerne County or problems with machines, but what are you hearing? Uh, Deputy Secretary Marks, are you unmuted? Oh, yeah. Can you hear okay. me okay? Yeah. Do you want to just give a brief uh, sure. overview I'll, of any? Yeah. I'll try to give an overview. We, we, um, the, the biggest issue we've heard uh, seems to be a, a fairly typical one where you have polling places that open late for one reason or another. Um, uh, poll workers having trouble getting the voting systems up and running. Um, a, a lot of times it is just the poll workers arriving late at the polling place. Um, we did hear, uh, you mentioned Luzerne County, we did hear of some um, uh, voting system issues in one precinct in, in Luzerne County. Um, but the majority of our, our issues so far today seem to be um, polling places that didn't open late or polling places that got off to a slow start um, because of uh, some technical issues or some confusion from uh, the poll workers. Uh, we've also gotten some complaints about political signs being uh, perhaps closer to the entrance of the room where voting occurs than they're supposed to be. Uh, I did want to, and I apologize, Secretary, I did want to, we did get one report uh, so far through social media of a poll watcher um, who was allegedly prevented from entering a polling place in Philadelphia. Uh, we reached out to the county and we understand that the county was getting in contact with the polling place uh, to confirm and to um, to verify that poll watcher's credentials. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Bill Kibler from the Altoona Mirror, and on deck will be Alana Abramson from Time Magazine. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Um, can you talk about the possible consequences if the Supreme Court rules that fill in ballots arriving at PM today valid? and the possibility that, that that might affect overseas and military ballots that uh, aren't due until a week after the election. So you cut out a little bit, so I just wanna make sure. So your question is how, how the, if this, can you ask your question again? Sure, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's just great, it's just choppy. Can you talk about the possible consequences should the US Supreme Court take up the matter of the uh, three-day grace period and rule that mail-in ballots that arrive after 8 p.m. today are invalid, especially given the possibility that overseas and military ballots have never been due until a week, a week after today. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. So I want to just be clear that the U.S. Supreme Court decision will not impact overseas and military voters. So they were not part of this, of that lawsuit or the extension of time for mail due to mail delays of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So it so let me be clear, it does not impact, it will not shorten any time frame for military and overseas voters. Um, but you know if the one of the reasons why we've been urging all voters to just get their ballots in by today is to avoid there being any significant numbers that come in after today. So, you know, until we know what those numbers are, it's hard to know exactly what the impact would be. So as you know, we've sent guidance to the counties telling them when they start to canvas those ballots, 
that they should keep them segregated. So it's gonna be very clean. It's gonna be easy to distinguish. Um, those ballots are gonna be counted for, I mean, the, you know, the, the decision would only impact um, some federal races uh, in any event. So no matter what, those ballots are being counted and they'll be you know, added to, no matter what, whether the Supreme Court gets involved or not, those ballots are being counted for the purpose of state races and possibly other races. Um, and it's only limited numbers of federal races that would even be impacted. So you know, we'll have to see what kind of numbers come in and obviously we'll have to see whether the Supreme Court decides to take it up again or not. All right, we'll go to Alana Abramson from uh, Time Magazine and then Todd Barkley from Talk Williamsport. Go ahead, Alana. Um, hi, Secretary, thank you for doing the call. I was actually about to ask about Luzerne County, but I see that's been answered. I was wondering if you would be able to provide data tomorrow on the number of ballots that had been rejected for any reason and the number of voters who were able to cure them or vote, cast provisional ballots, apologies. So um, that will probably take more time than tomorrow. Deputy Secretary Marks, I don't know if uh, you have a general time frame for when we might, when we would normally get a sense of rejected ballots from the counties, or is that sort of on the same time frame as the canvas in general? I can't say exactly when we'll get final numbers. We will certainly have preliminary numbers based on what the counties are recording in the shore system uh, when they record ballots, but to the extent that they're still adjudicating uh, some ballots, we may not know the final number for several days. Uh, on the second part of the question, provisional ballots, uh, we'll have a, sort of an unofficial number of those as well. Uh, provisional ballots are actually canvassed at a, at a hearing um, several days after an election. So we may have a, a high level count but we're not necessarily going to know which ones are fully counted, which ones are partially counted, uh, and which ones aren't counted at all until the counties actually certify those numbers to us. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Todd Bartley from uh, Talk Williamsport, and then uh, next up will be Cynthia Fernandez from Spotlight PA. Go ahead, Todd. Good morning, Secretary. Morning. Uh, I have a question in regard to the uh, trailing numbers over the last 14 days in COVID-19 cases. Uh, it's just north of 27,000 people. Uh, if they were all contact traced, roughly 20 folks is the average of contact tracing. That's over a half a million uh, Pennsylvanians that may be impacted with COVID-19 quarantines. Uh, there was a letter that normally goes out and a phone call that goes out from Department of Health that would tell those people to be in quarantine. Who's ultimately responsible for informing those folks that are in um, C-19 quarantine on the procedure and how to vote and pick up the emergency ballot. So, Deputy Secretary Marks, I don't know if you want to weigh in on this. I mean, I know um, it's, you know, that there's a lot of different folks who are communicating uh, on this, but Deputy Secretary Marks, I don't know if you want to, if you can give an overview of the, I mean, you, you know that they can vote by emergency absentee ballot, right? Todd, so, so there's, there, there is that opportunity for voters who can't come out. But Jonathan, I don't know if you want to talk some about um, the process of how this is working. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the process, if, if for any reason um, you, and it doesn't necessarily, you know, obviously it, it's um, with COVID-19, it, it takes on greater importance, I guess. Um, maybe importance is not the best word, but uh, you know, even if you're called away on business or, or some reason like that, there is an emergency um, uh, absentee ballot process. Uh, and, and the voter has the right to have a third party um, deliver their, actually go pick up the balloting materials, deliver it to them, uh, and take it back to the county election office. Uh, and if the voter cannot find somebody uh, to do that, then the county is obligated to provide, um, you know, either someone from the sheriff's office or some other county official uh, that can go out and, and deliver the balloting materials to the voter and bring them back to the to the county election office. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the process in a nutshell. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Cynthia Fernandez from Spotlight PA, and next up will be Sarah Murray from CNN. Go ahead, Cynthia. 
Hi, um, I'd like to know what you and your general counsel team are expecting in terms of litigation and if you're preparing to uh, you yourself litigate, like DOS be something. Do I plan on bringing a lawsuit? Um, I have no anticipation of bringing a lawsuit unless uh, needed, but uh, so far so good. <laughs> um, so I, you know, it, uh, as for anticipating other litigation, um, you know, I think I think I said yesterday. Look, I can't get in the heads of everyone who might contemplate bringing a lawsuit, particularly this year when there's been more litigation than maybe ever before in the history of elections in this country. Um, but uh, but we are prepared. So basically we are, our, you know, all, there are many, many excellent lawyers that we work with and they are prepared on every front. Thank you, Secretary. We'll go to Sarah Murray from CNN and then to Kim Glovis from KYW News Radio. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Wanda, and thank you, Secretary, for doing this. We appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you repeatedly today. <laughs> Uh, um, <laughs> I just wanted to start uh, to, uh, to get a little bit more clarity on these ballots that might co be coming in after 8 p.m. by mail. I know that you guys have advised counties to segregate them and that they can begin counting them when they come in. What is the mechanism, though, for reporting that? Will those totals be reported on the website somewhere separately? Um, and then my other question is just if, if there's an update uh, at all in counties that do not plan on canvassing until tomorrow morning, if that number is still at nine or if it's changed. So Deputy Secretary Marks, let's start with the second one first. Is uh, I, I don't think the numbers of counties that were, have much changed. Uh, do you about who's planning to start when? No, we we did have we did have our staff reach out to a handful of counties to confirm um, that they were in fact doing a pre canvas. But the number of counties that that weren't um, hasn't changed. Uh, now there there are there are a couple a couple of those counties um, on that list are doing some of the pre canvas activities today, vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis examining the envelopes. Um, and, and doing that sort of front end process. They're just not actually going to open the inner envelope and, and tabulate until tomorrow. So they are doing part of the pre canvas. They just won't begin tabulation of ballots until tomorrow. But uh, no, we haven't, nothing we've learned this morning indicates that, that a whole lot has changed um, in the last few days. And I wanted to say the, the number of voters that are represented in these counties is very small. It's a tiny fraction of the total mail-in and absentee ballot counting in the Pennsylvania. So I want to be clear, I don't think any of that will impact how long it takes to count the ballots in Pennsylvania. Like the, the counties that have hundreds of thousands, it's going to take them longer anyway. So I just want to be clear, the estimate of time frame that will have the overwhelming majority of ballots counted within a couple of days still stands regardless of whether it's five or seven or whatever number of counties that are waiting till tomorrow morning. Most of them are very are small. Um, Jonathan, I don't know if you want to uh, talk about the first question as well. Which now I'm, I'm trying to gonna... recall the first yeah. question. <laughs> Eric, can you repeat it, or Wanda, yeah, if you uh... it, it was just um, how we will actually get the, you know, the numbers oh, oh. the ballots that would be coming in after p.m. and in the following days. I mean, I know they can start counting, but how will those numbers be made public? Do you want to talk a little bit about the guidance, Jonathan? And, I mean, they're going to be segregated, yeah. right? I mean, right. so it's it's going to all be trackable because they'll be segregated. Jonathan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to report totals by group, um, but I don't know that that, if your question is, is that going to be obvious on our website? Um, the, the answer is no, not in the short term, but once, uh, once counties start um, reporting those returns, we'll be able to delineate between how many votes were cast on ballots that, that were received by the 8 p.m. deadline versus how many votes are from those ballots uh, after the 8 p.m., uh, the, the normal statutory deadline of 8 p.m. on election day. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, we'll go to Kim Lovis from KYW News Radio and then to Alex Hosenball from ABC News. Go ahead, Kim. Yes. Good morning, Secretary. Um, my question is, uh, what is and what isn't voter intimidation outside of polling place? And uh, if you could uh, clarify on the 10-foot the rule. So there's, we have guidance on our website that really goes into detail. We have, I think, two different things that you should look at. One is poll watchers guidance and the other is I think it's actually called something like intimidation at the polls. Jonathan, do you remember what, what that other guidance is called? And can you just give an overview about some of the examples of what is and the 10 foot rule? Sure. Um, I, I'll start with the 10 foot rule first. I mean, the 10 foot rule is basically it, it is the, the purpose of it is to make sure voters can get in and out of the polling place uh, unimpeded um, and it it prohibits electioneering and posting of signs and other materials inside of that 10 foot radius. But where a lot of times there's confusion is where the 10 foot start, where the 10 feet start. It's, it's the room where the voting is occurring. The polling place is de defined as the room. So if you have a municipal building, for example, and you walk down a hallway to a room that is 50 feet inside the building, there's nothing prohibiting somebody from electioneering right outside the entrance to the building because the room itself is in, in another area uh, deep inside the building. So I just want to make that clarification. We get a lot of complaints and a lot of questions every election because there's some confusion about where that line starts. Um, in, in terms of voter intimidation, uh, there is a list. I, I don't have it committed to memory. There is a list that, uh, in our guidance uh, on our website uh, but it's really anything that is intended to uh, prevent people from voting, uh, suppress the vote. It, it is, uh, you know, it is any action that is, that is meant to intimidate somebody. So, you know, for example, um, I, you know, we, we've, we've addressed this issue before, so I'll talk about this one as the most often used example. You know, we have a uh, right to carry uh, firearms uh, in 66 of 67 counties in Pennsylvania. And carrying a firearm is not prohibited, but using that firearm to intimidate a voter, brandishing the firearm or, or you know, otherwise uh, using it in a way that is meant to be intimidating. Um, I, you know, in the COVID-19 world uh, now, we, we saw sort of a new one in, in the primary where, you know, some someone took their mask off and coughed on somebody, you know, intentionally to, so it would be anything that would, that would, you know, try to um, suppress somebody's right to vote. Uh, but there is a list, uh, a list in our guidance. It's rather lengthy that sort of defines what's voter intimidation versus, you know, what isn't. And, and I'll just add to it. So some other things, you know, so nobody can ask, nobody aside from a poll worker, should be asking any voter for documentation, for ID, for proof of anything. The, the answer by the voter, they should just ignore anybody who's trying to ask them those kinds of questions. Um, they can't have somebody who's, they can ignore, if somebody's just trying to ask them who they're voting for or make them feel, oh, take pictures of them while they're doing something. Like those are all in, in, a, in a way that's uh, intimidating to the voter. Um, those are all intimidation. So, you know, look at, I do urge you to look at the guidance because it goes through in some details, but, um, but, you know, I want to urge all voters to know that you don't have to talk to them at all. Zero. The only people you need to talk to are the poll workers, and they are the ones who actually know what the processes are, and you can ignore everybody else. Thank you, Secretary. We'll go to Alex Hosenball from ABC News, and then we will wrap up with Jen Samuel from the Daily Local News in Westchester. Go ahead, Alex. Great. Um, first, I just wanted to respond directly to uh, Deputy Secretary Marks in a way that I think would be helpful to everyone on the call. Um, you know, the Mike Roman tweet with the big poster outside the school polling place, I think, you know, that's going to be just a central question right now. Is that illegal electioneering based on what you've seen, based on the depth inside the building? Um, and then I wanted to ask, uh, so in Philadelphia, the Trump campaign is currently making challenges. Um, there's a challenge about counting the pre-canvas votes. 
uh, and there's tweets, unfounded tweets about the same thing in Allegheny County that the uh, pre-canvassers are, are keeping the poll watchers too far back or something like that. Are you expecting more of that across the state? So I'm going to defer to Jonathan some on the specific questions, but um, but there there you can't. They, you're talking about challenging mail and absentee votes because that that ship has sailed. So nobody, no authorized representatives can be challenging mail in or absentee ballots during the pre canvas or canvas at all. There's not there's no provision in Pennsylvania law for that. Um, they can challenge voters at the polling place, and they could of course bring a lawsuit, as we know. Uh, not having any merit has never stopped uh, most people from, or some people, I should say, uh, doesn't seem to stop many people from bringing lawsuits, but there's no statutory provision for authorized representatives to bring challenges during pre-canvassing. Um, Jonathan, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with the exact details of the other questions. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the Mike Roman tweet. Um, I, I did see that, uh, and, and it's a picture of a, of a sample ballot posted by, a, you know, a political party with their slate of candidates, uh, and it's on the wall of the building. Uh, we did contact the Philadelphia uh, County Election Office. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been able to follow up with our staff to find out if we got more details, but as, as I said earlier, it's going to, whether it's a violation or not is going to matter you know, it's hard to tell from those pictures if that is just the entrance to the building um, and the polling, the polling place, the room where voting occur is occurring is further into the building. So it's really going to depend on exactly where the polling place is located. If it's directly inside those doors, then I would think the judge of elections has an obligation to remove the sign. Um, or at least ask, uh, ask whoever posted the sign to move it outside of that 10 foot radius. Thank you. All right, we will wrap things up now with Jen Samuel from Daily Local News. Go ahead, Jen. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes, Thank Wonderful. You. Well, my question is, I mean, what a year. Everyone says, a lot of people say 2020, anything can happen. So my last question was, what has inspired you the most? I know people have different opinions on different political viewpoints. And at this juncture, our country is very much divided, it seems, um, between right and left. Um, but there's so much that unites us as, as human beings and as American citizens. And I was just wondering what has been the most inspirational moment for you getting to this day, November 3rd? Thank you for asking such a uplifting question. <laughs> it's like, it's so refreshing. Um, so thank you for that. I, you know, this year has been filled with so many moments of inspiration. It, I, so I'll start with Act 77, you know, which was signed into law a year and a couple of days ago. So on October 31st, 2019, the governor signed it into law. And Boy, I mean, our department, I mean, Jonathan's been with the Department of State for a long time. I'm not going to say how many years, Jonathan, because I know you get mad at me. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, that law alone, which was historic bipartisan legislation, provided more voting rights to Pennsylvanians than we've seen, you know, in over 80 years. And then when you had the global pandemic hit and so many Pennsylvanians chose those options, knew that, you know, found out quickly that there was still a way to participate. And then we saw in 20, you know, in the primary of 2020, even in the middle of a global pandemic, the immense turnout that we had. I mean, I, you know, you probably heard me talk about it in during the primary. So in the primary, we ended up having close to 2.9 million Pennsylvanians vote. And the last time we had an uncontested primary on both sides of the aisle, which was 2012, a total of 1.5 million Pennsylvanians voted. So thanks to Act 77 and to tremendous bilingual, you know, radio, TV, digital, mail, uh, public education, record numbers of Pennsylvanians came out to vote. And we're seeing the same thing today. So we all know that the numbers of COVID-19 are increasing. We all know that there's, you know, high tensions, a lot of stress, tremendous amounts of disinformation that's got to be incredibly confusing, not to mention record numbers of lawsuits. 
And yet we have over 2.5 million Pennsylvanians who have already voted, have already voted, and we haven't even had the polls close. So I think what's most inspiring to me is how many Pennsylvanians are just completely engaged in exercising their fundamental right to vote and exercising their many options that Act 77 provided them. And that's a good place to wrap up. Uh, thank you everyone for being with us. Uh, we will be in person tonight at the Farm Show Complex uh, at 9 p.m. and again at 11. You do have to RSVP in order to be admitted to those, uh, those press conferences. You need to have credentials as well and uh, masks will be required. So uh, we'll see a lot of you tonight at 9 p.m. at the Farm Show Complex. Thank you again, Secretary and Deputy Secretary. Thanks everyone.